Taiwanese voters have elected William Lai Ching Te to be their new president. That means the ruling DPP party has now won an unprecedented third term, much to Beijing's chagrin. Yu Chen Li joins me for more from Taipei. Yu Chen, welcome back to the show. What does this result tell us about Taiwan's future economic relations with China? So it's very likely China is going to step up its military and economic coercion against Taiwan. Actually, today, just a couple of hours ago, one of Taiwan's uh, diplomatic allies, Nauru, a Pacific island, announced that it would cut ties with Taiwan and turn to China. It's happened only just two days after election. So you can see that China is very unhappy with um, about the results. And a lot of uh, experts are saying, um, actually, China's economic pressure is reaching a new level. In the past few um, years in elections, China is uh, more focusing on the war peace uh, narrative. But now, um, it is the first time it uh, framed the election as a choice between prosperity and economic Decline. So, as we can see, like in the future, China will continue its um, stops on friendly economic policy uh, designed for for Taiwan, and at the same time, it would also impose some incentives to uh, sorry incentive to attract Taiwanese business. For example, like it has this integrated development project that would want to attract Taiwanese businessmen to do uh, operate business in one of its provinces, Fujian. So we can. See see that the economic relations between the two sides is going to be another four years of turbulence. We saw that Beijing had something of, of a carrot and stick approach to swaying Taiwan before the election. You mentioned the framing of this election in terms of the economy. We saw that China lifted some export bans, for example, but then also it continued this kind of military pressure with increased fighter jet incursions. Do we get any sense from this election result about China's approach? Is it any sort of judgment on China's approach and what that ultimately meant to Taiwanese voters? Mm -hmm. So uh, we can see that despite China's warnings, Taiwan still elects a president-elect that China really dislikes. But when you lo really look at the votes, the president-elect uh, guide, and he actually only won 40 percent of the votes, which means that um, nearly 60 percent of Taiwanese voters still uh, support uh, opposition parties which campaign for closer economic ties with China. And actually, uh, one of Taiwanese chemical giants, Formosa Plastics, also said, uh, you know, like recently China's uh, reaction of stopping tariff reduction for petrochemical has a really uh, significant impact on many industries. And it also uh, said that it wants more exchanges and cooperation with China instead of confrontation and, and disputes between the two sides. So you can see that a lot of um, industries are actually hit hard by some of the uh, China uh, China's co economic coercion even just before the election. And we're going to see more, uh, more and more economic coercion and pressure from China after the election. Jens Dahm is a professor at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Jens, welcome to the show. After this election, what kind of economic fallout could we expect to see? First of all, we have to understand that during the last eight years, when Tsai Ing-wen was president, there had been already a reduction of trade and investment between China and Taiwan, mostly due to the pressure from China, but it was also the policy of the DPP and Tsai Ing-wen that trade should be directed away from China, mostly to Southeast Asia, to the United States of America, to Europe and to Japan. So this will definitely continue. We have already seen that China proposed new tariffs on some products imported from Taiwan, chemical products. So there will be economic pressure from China at least until May when Lai Jingde will become president officially in Taiwan. So I would not expect that there will be great changes, but there will be some economic pressure from China, also depending on William Lai's presidency and his policy. So we have to wait and see, but 
besides some military pressure, there will definitely be economic pressure. These two economies have traditionally had a very intensive trade relationship despite the tensions. Is it realistic to expect that to pull further apart, considering all of the, the cross-straits trade that we see, actually? No, I don't think so. There will be in some fields, China will show Taiwan uh, that Taiwan has to react in a way um, to keep the status quo. They will carefully watch every word from President Lai. Tsai Ing-wen was really good in not provoking China, but still trade was going down. And uh, we have seen direct investment from China to Taiwan, direct investment from Taiwan to China has reached new lows during the last two years. But of course, that was also due to the pandemic. So we have two things. It was the pandemic and now the president lie, which definitely will hinder the economic relations between two sides. But as you just mentioned, they are very much interwoven. Still, China is the most important trading partner for Taiwan. So I don't think it will be go down to zero, but there will be diversification, definitely. We often hear about the role of advanced semiconductors in this relationship. In every country's relationship with Taiwan, TSMC is building some of the most advanced, if not the most advanced semiconductors out there. They say, and other experts that the technology is, in some cases, years, if not decades ahead of their competitors. What does that mean in a relationship like this? China obviously needs these conductors, semiconductors, as much as any other country. Is, does that play an outsized role, or is that a bit exaggerated? How do you see it? Um, it definitely plays a very important role. On the other hand, China really tries very hard to keep up with Taiwan with its own semiconductors. Uh, they are spending billions of, of dollars to set up their own semiconductor industry. But up to now, they have not reached that level which Taiwan has. So there is still several years, I would say, we can expect that China definitely needs the semiconductors from Taiwan. But if they really decide that Taiwan has to be unified, or they call it reunified with China, then they would not care. So I think economic considerations play a certain role within the Chinese government at the moment, but they definitely want to reduce this kind of dependence on Taiwan. And they know they still need several years or maybe one decade to reach this level. We've seen in recent years how Taiwan has managed to forge some new links to the EU. And I'm thinking of the Baltic states in particular when it comes to both diplomatic and trade relationships. Will we see it continue to push in the EU? Is that a focal point for Taiwan in the years to come, both on the trade and, and diplomatic ends? Um, as said before, Taiwan really wants to diversify, so the European Union, the United States, Japan all play a very important role. Um, we should not overestimate the case of Lithuania, because Lithuania is a very small country. So definitely Lithuania could choose between China and Taiwan, and somehow they choose Taiwan over China. But of course, if we look at the larger economies, like France, Germany, also the United Kingdom, they definitely have much stronger relations with China and they would not really sacrifice their economic relations with Taiwan. So I think the European Union both wants to have good relations, especially with semiconductors, of course, with Taiwan, also supporting Taiwan as a democracy, but at the same time, as we can see now with the new relation, better relation between uh, Xi Jinping and Joe Biden, also the European Union does not want to destroy their economic relations with mm. China. So at it's a time. really complicated issue, which we can see, but I would not say that we can just exchange Taiwan with China. Mm. Taiwan is much too small.
At the same time, we did see Brussels and other EU countries, in a sense, stick up for Lithuania as it came under more pressure from China because of that change in uh, trade relationships, that kind of stuff. Did that not uh, sort of send some courage to the EU and to these nations when it comes to Chinese threats about this very issue? Did that not somehow change the dynamic in how these countries look at having relations in some sense with both China and Lithuania or and uh, Taiwan, I should say? Um, I would say that, first of all, I was also a little bit surprised that the European Union really stick with Lithuania, because during the last six or seven years, we quite often had that some smaller states like the Czech Republic before Hungary is still one of the nations which try to jeopardize a kind of um, general common policy of the European Union towards China. But in the case of Lithuania, there was a common policy from the European Commission, the Parliament, also from the larger economies within the European Union. And it worked because it did not really jeopardize the relations with China. So I think that was a kind of sign that also China, if it's being pushed, will then give in to some considerations. And with the case of Lithuania, it was the name change from Taipei to Taiwan. And I don't think that will that this will happen in any other country. So basically, I think the compromise was that, yes, in Lithuania, we have now a representative office of Taiwan, which is called Taiwan office and not Taipei representative office, but it will not happen in any other European country, I would say. Was there any message to this election when it comes to Beijing, or were there a lot of domestic concerns that were driving this as well? We know that the economy in Taiwan, uh, I believe that there's some, um, when it comes to demographics, there's some problems there when it comes to perhaps employment, uh, cost of living, things like that. These were also very much on the radar mm -hmm. for voters there, very much on their minds. To what extent can we say this is about that kind of relationship, and to what extent is it about really the domestic concerns? Um, the priority of the Taiwanese voters, why they voted as they did. So they voted for a president from the DPP because basically that was a kind of continuation of Tsai Ing-wen's policy. But on the other hand, if we look at the parliament where the Kuomintang now has a majority, um, then we have the DPP, then we have also a new party, DPP with eight parliamentarians. So definitely that was more an election on domestic issues. And as you just mentioned, one of the big issues is the un unemployment rate is rather low in Taiwan, but it's very hard for graduates from universities to find a well-paid job. So a lot of the jobs, uh, especially for younger people, are really not well paid. That is one of the big issues. Then housing crisis in Taiwan is very severe. So a lot of young people still have to live with their parents because they cannot afford to buy property or even to rent property. So there is a lot of domestic issues which basically decided what the voters wanted to have. And maybe if the Kuomintang had been less friendly towards China, they would have had a better chance to win the elections. So the election was not on the relation to China. It was much more on domestic issues. But there is a larger consensus in Taiwan that the relation to the United States, maybe also to Japan, the European Union, is more important than the relation to China. So, yes, there was also a kind of choice between these two sides, but it was much more domestic and economic issues which played a role. And what are the prospects now for solving some of those domestic problems now that you have a split government? This is only, I believe, the second split government in the island's history. The first one did not go well. What could this mean for some of those issues? It's hard to predict because now the split um, parliament, definitely we have a new party which 
itself calls it's between the Guomindang and the Progressive Democratic Progressive Party. So it could be that the DPP finally will work together with President Lai. And in this way, it could also be a good sign for Taiwan. We just don't know. It doesn't seem that there is a large anonymity between the DPP and the DPP. They are rather rational actors. So I still have some hope that this kind of government will work. But of course, as you said, it's hard to predict because we have not not really seen it before. But before it was a kind of different situation because now we have this new party which will put a lot of pressure on the DPP for some economic reforms, for legislative reforms, oversight, um, anti-corruption measures. So I'm a little bit optimistic that it could work, but we will see. All right, that's Jens Dahm at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Thank you so much. Thank you. Riley Walters is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Riley, welcome. China tried both carrots and sticks to put pressure on Taiwan before the election, including trade incentives. Do you think this election tells us anything about the Taiwan electorate's response to those measures? Well, I... You know, I think that people of Taiwan are very concerned about their own economic futures. Uh, wage growth was a, a big discussion. Uh, housing opportunities uh, was also a big platform in this election. But when it comes to trade with China, I think there's definitely this uh, a little uh, push and pull. Uh, Taiwanese people want to still continue to engage with China because it it's still an important economic partner of uh, Taiwan. But there is also concern about economic rely uh, too much economic reliance on China, and so uh, I, I think some are willing to uh, cut the uh, eat the costs of cutting ties a little bit more economically with China, uh, but still at the same time uh, engaging uh, whenever they can find less risky opportunities. To what extent can Taiwan really cut ties with China? We know that it has this kind of Southeast Asia strategy that it wants to diversify trade as much as possible. But these are these are two economies that have been intensively um, uh, bound together for much of their history when it comes to trade. It's certainly going to be tough to sever, uh, you know, complete ties with China. I don't think anyone's expecting to do that, though. Uh, I think there's definitely hope that things can be shifted in the margins. As you've already said, uh, you know, there's there's hope that we can uh, the, the Taiwanese can shift uh, trade and investment flows out of China into Southeast Asia. Uh, and we are seeing some of that. You know, we, we've already seen exports to China drop last year significantly. Some of that has to do with China's own stagnating economy. But others, uh, other other parts of that have to do with the just higher uh, interest in Southeast Asia, uh, given its uh, less politically uh, risky environment. Uh, but yes, it. it it will be difficult to, to cut too much, but I think there's definitely hope that uh, certain things, certain industries uh, in particular, can, can be shifted southbound and, and therefore uh, hopefully reduce some of the reliance on China. What role can the U.S. play? Will the U.S. play when it comes to Taiwan diversifying that trade? Well, I think there's a hope that the United States can become a, an even larger trading partner of, of Taiwan. We have this trade initiative ongoing with Taiwan uh, hopefully, this can help build some of our bilateral trade flows, even investment flows to go with that, uh, again, as as a as an opportunity to sort of reduce the reliance, not just for Taiwan, but for the United States on the Chinese economy. Uh, again, it, it's going to be marginal growth at best, uh, and we're never going to really uh, become unreliant on the Chinese market. But uh, hopefully, it can reduce some of the, the riskier envir- uh, industries where uh, geopolitics tends to have a uh, more of a, a cost uh, on, on the decision making of, of, of companies. Are there political risks on both sides to more intense trade if that is a political possibility? Trade is always political. <laughs> you know, from my view in Washington, uh, trade has been politicized for, I, I, I've lost count, for many years, uh, and it's never going to become unpoliticized. Um, so what we're seeing with U.S.-Taiwan trade directly, um, it is it is moving forward, but it is slow going. Uh, again, like I said, because of the politics of trade, you know, we haven't seen 
progress on, let's say, for example, a U.S.-Taiwan bilateral trade agreement, but we are seeing these high-level trade negotiations ongoing. Uh, there is a hope that these will spur, again, trade and investment. We'll see how much it actually helps. And then on the inverse of that, of course, the United States and Taiwan respectively have their own trade negotiations with Beijing, uh, which uh, can be very politicized, uh, but are important to continue at least, uh, nonetheless, given that China is still an important trading partner for the United States and Taiwan. When we talk about Taiwan, we often talk about advanced semiconductor chips. How important is a company like TSMC when we talk about trade relationships, even political support? Has it been overblown somewhat, or are, is this really an important factor for countries, for economies as they deal with Taiwan? Uh, I think not just the United States, uh, Taiwan, Beijing, uh, Japan, Europe, I, 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 we've seen for the last several years countries all over the world highlight that the semiconductor industry is probably one of their most important industries right now. And there's a lot of efforts ongoing to domesticate a lot of semiconductor manufacturing. TSMC happens to be at the heart of many of those countries' programs. So we're seeing TSMC investment in the United States. We're seeing TSMC investment in Japan. And it's, it's not just uh, old technology. This is some of, uh, toward leading, some of the leading edge technology to help uh, grow future industries. You know, it's, it's sort of uh, investing in the future for American industry, Japanese industry. Uh, and so there's definitely a lot of hope that TSMC can sort of be at the heart of this uh, investment toward the future. TSMC also with a very big investment, planned investment here in Germany, as it has investments in the U.S. What do you see in the EU stance toward Taiwan? Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts there. Germany, on the one hand, has very deep business ties, obviously with the mainland. But then we look at the Baltics, nations like Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, especially Lithuania, pushing very stridently towards more relations. Do you have any thoughts on, on where this could be going or if Taiwan sees opportunity there? I think Taiwan definitely sees opportunity in Europe. Um, you know, obviously, each European country has interests of its own. Uh, I think, you know, for, from my own personal perspective, uh, obviously, I like engagement with Taiwan. So the more that we can see the uh, United States and uh, its partners and allies and others across the world engage more with Taiwan, I think uh, we'll all be better off. Uh, Taiwan, of course, is an important democratic uh, uh, partner, a, a beacon of democracy in Asia. And it is a very important technology and trade uh, partner as well for many of these countries. And so uh, one of the things that Taiwan also happens to do, uh, at least with through the engagement, either economically or otherwise, uh, is, is it does offer up an alternative to the Beijing narrative, the, this narrative that China, that, that uh, the future of economic growth is through China alone. Uh, necessarily believe that I think that Taiwan offers a significant opportunity uh, for uh, many of these growth prospects. I want to ask you finally, we just talked about the Taiwanese election tomorrow. The American elections began uh, in earnest, really, uh, with the Iowa caucus. What are the threats or opportunities for Taiwan and its relationship with the U.S., whether it's economically, politically? I wonder if you could share a few words on that. Uh, yeah, I, I think I have two thoughts on that. One is the United States is supportive of Taiwan. I, you've seen statements from uh, a number of high-level U.S. officials, uh, Republicans and Democrats, uh, come out over the weekend in support of Taiwan's uh, recent election and, and the new president-elect uh, uh, Lai ching The uh, That's one. The, the second is, uh, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, trade, for example, is very highly politicized. And so uh, we see a couple. We we see at least one candidate, for example, in the United States, uh, talk about how they're interested in uh, raising global tariff rates. Uh, that is not necessarily. Uh, 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 it, it, it could potentially be applied to Taiwan as well as everyone else, depending on the, the future of uh, U.S. trade negotiations, uh, making things very difficult. Uh, I don't. I don't think that's necessarily going to happen. I hope that's not going to happen. Uh, but again, for the United States and every country, really, it all starts at home. And so uh, trade, for example, being one of those highly politicized things could end up being a negative on the U.S.-Taiwan relationship in the future, 
EU, despite the fact that uh, recent ongoing uh, uh, trade and investment and technology dialogues with Taiwan have been very successful um, and will likely continue uh, and uh, hopefully mitigate any future political costs. All right. That's Riley Walters at the Hudson Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you.